I think there's only a little bit further up that you will see the interest rates go for the two to five year terms. And the reason for that is that although the Reserve Bank's cash rate is, is only 2%, they project four, I think they'll get to maybe, maybe three and a half. The markets have, have already factored in at least a move to 4%, in fact, slightly higher. And the fixed interest rates reflect expectations of what will happen in the future, not what is happening right now. Welcome back to Tea with Tony. Things are starting to bite and all at once. We've got rising interest rates, spiraling inflation, supply and labour shortages, house prices declining, consumer confidence tanking, and on the flip side, startlingly low rates of unemployment. Will this all add up to a recession? And positively, can we bounce through as quickly as we bounced in? Let's get Tony's take. Hey Tony, how are you? Good, thanks, let's go. Good, and uh, yeah, that long list you've got there, I could add in brain drain as well. Young Kiwis going off to Australia, obviously Ukraine soaring food and energy prices, uh, China's you know supply chain problems, etc. I think you did reference uh, 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 that one to a certain extent. I've been explaining to people recently that central banks overstimulated their economies in 2021. Mm. Not so much 2020 when they were stopping a depression scenario, but they kept interest rates too low last year, too much money printed and sloshing around. Economies have basically now got overcooked. Uh, their unemployment rates are too low, pressure on resources is extreme, and just as luck would have it, when we're getting the inflationary pressures from overcooking the economies, we've got the extra pressure from the China supply chain interruptions, the food and energy prices soaring because of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And what that means now is that central banks are having to radically accelerate the increases in interest rates and they're trying to slow their economies down as quickly as humanly possible. And so Perverse as this may sound, the worse the economic data get in the short term around the world, the better. It means the interest rates won't have to go so high, they won't have to stay up for so long. But we, we are in a bit of a maelstrom in this uh, approaching second half of uh, 2022. Further increases in interest rates, but everything's been accelerated and condensed in time is essentially what's uh, what's going on now. And of course, it doesn't feel very nice, but we've been talking about this for months now that it was coming, and and it suddenly it's it's my question around that is this the perfect storm or more of a case of a short sharp tornado? So, you know, give us give us some hope here, Tony. <laughs> yeah, the main hope is that uh, I believe the crunch on consumer spending our Reserve Bank in particular wants by raising interest rates is actually happening. And that's something I've actually emphasized here and in all my different publications since about February when my first spending plans monthly survey for the year showed a big dropping away in the intentions which average Kiwis have about buying things. And then those intentions got worse in May and again in June. And then just last week we had one of the banks, their quarterly consumer confidence numbers uh, was at a record low. You know, consumers are being crunched at the moment, not just by falling house prices, rising interest rates, uh, but the cost of living increasing strongly. And the thing to keep in mind here is this. If we're talking about a normal monetary policy tightening cycle, interest rates rising, you're only affecting one third of households. Only one third of households actually have a mortgage. One third are renting, the other third have already paid off their mortgage. So when interest rates go up, only about one third of uh, Kiwis have been affected. But you boost our cost of living by 6.9%, we are all negatively affected. There's sort of a strong bang for your buck and depressing confidence and uh, and eventually spending out of that. So yeah, the main positive I'd make at the moment, you know, I, I could have said um, prices for our exports are very, very strong. Job security is also uh, uh, quite strong. The international tourists are coming back again. Next year, we've got the um, uh, foreign students starting to come back. But from my point of view as an economist, the thing that gives me greatest hope for things are going to start to look better in within 12 months is the fact they're looking worse right at the moment. Right, so you're really talking about a shorter, shorter sharper tornado than a, you know, a, an obliteration or a, or a long-term sequence of hurricanes, which is quite nice to consider. Um, I think it's easy for us, because we talk about this in depth every month, to go, oh, yep, it's heading in the same direction that we said it would, to if you're someone, if you put it into real human terms of 
buying food at the supermarket, um, you know, driving your children to school. Um, it, it's hurting everyday Kiwis, and we see it with our clients, you know, and their sentiment and their concerns every day of the week. So. Um, Please don't think that we're not taking, you know, we're taking it too lightly. What we're trying to do is give you context around um, how soon or quickly it will ease. Let, let me just remind people that when COVID-19 came along, our central bank did what other central banks decided to do at the time. They said, we are going to explicitly take the risk of cutting interest rates too far, leaving them too low for too long, printing too much money, causing too much growth in our economies too much inflation that's what we're aiming for because we know how to fight inflation we'll just raise interest rates until it goes back down again whereas if they were worried if they didn't ease monetary policy enough then the economy would spiral down but they should have recognized they were overcooking things over a year ago even 18 months ago they should have seen that things were strong so this is all an accelerated catch-up by the central banks uh, trying to scare people out there but I definitely I can assure you see light at the end of the tunnel and there's a very good chance that the mortgage interest rates in fact will have peaked for maybe maybe all but the one year fixed rate by the end of this year quite frankly there's a lot to pick out of there it's really good points Tony uh, technical I, I, I'm interested in, in a in a a technical explanation, well a simple technical explanation of what a recession is and its impacts because we all get kind of scared of the headline but what does it actually mean and um, you know and we talked about the factors that are going to probably drive us into a recession but, but what will it mean and, and in this case how long how long do we think it'll, it'll stick around for? Right. A, if we have a recession, I think it's likely to be a fairly uh, short-lived one. A recession is technically two quarters, three-month mm. periods in a row when the economy shrinks. So you could get minus 0 0.1 followed by minus 0 0.1. That's a recession. All it means is that in that case, 99.8% of economic activity is still chugging along like it was um, before. Of course, it could be that you shrink by you know 2% over a six-month period, which would be pretty severe, quite quite frankly. But yeah, if, if you get our economy shrinking, let's say 1.5%, that still means 98.5% of economic activity is continuing along. But the main impact tends to be if you get businesses going into a recession and their balance sheets are bloated, they've got too many staff, they've got inventories which are too big and so they lay people off, we all see the layoffs, we cut back on our spending in case we get laid off and the whole thing spirals down again for you know quite some time until interest rates and the exchange rate you know plummet away, you go back the other side. Key thing to note this time around, there are very, very, very few businesses outside real estate agencies out there who have too many staff. They have not enough staff. There's going to be very little business rationalization of, we are bloated, we've got to lay off 20% of people. No, they want to hire 20% more people at the moment because you know of the activity levels they're going. So that's a big insulating uh, uh, factor. And the other one is, Many businesses, well, they don't have the inventories, the stock levels they want. They're still scrambling to try and get more raw materials. So there's a sort of downward spiral that uh, traditionally exists that isn't going to be around. And as I noted earlier, New Zealand's export prices are exceptionally strong. Part of our economy benefits from the unfortunate circumstances in, in Europe. Food prices are high, and we see Fonterra recently projecting the highest ever payout um, to their suppliers, uh, uh, for instance. So there are some big insulating factors for our, our economy, and I think for a lot of businesses, um, they're still going to do fine, and if they see some layoffs down the road, they're going to be down there outside the gate trying to hire those, uh, those, those people. You kind of alluded to this before, but I want to want to get more into kind of inflation, interest rates, mon monetary policy. But I've pulled a brilliant quote of yours from one of your updates. Um, Excessive monetary policy easing turned housing into a pyramid scheme. I haven't seen it as well articulated. Um, you alluded to it before. Let's let's talk about that a little bit in in, in you know as a where we've landed as a result. No one likes to feel that they're missing out on something. If you've got two children and you give each of them an ice cream with uh, one scoop, happy children. 
but you give one of those children an ice cream with two scoops, at least one of those children is going to be very, very unhappy, and they want two scoops. And so when we see house prices rising, we see average people, or people we think are below average, making easy money from some rubbishy investment property or section that they bought one or five years ago. We think to ourselves, well, I'm more intelligent than them. I think I can make money as well. I'm missing out on something. And so because of that, that missing out, the FOMO, fear of missing out, we all start piling in and buying property that previously we had no intention of buying an extra property, uh, signing up for a new house or you know, uh, investment property there or, or a section. And we just start piling in until something makes us go, oh, what was I thinking? Maybe it's interest rates going high and we can't afford it any longer or I wonder if there's going to be an oversupply of new properties and so you start pulling back from the new builds, which is, is happening in spades uh, at the moment, or you go, seriously, how long can this continue? And so maybe you start to sell and then everyone else sees, oh hang on, prices aren't rising any longer? I think I'd better sell that piece of rubbish I bought 18 months ago. And the whole thing goes down the other way. And that's what I try and capture with my FOMO and my FOOP readings, fear of missing out, fear of overpaying. And in the frenzy, the proportion of real estate agents in my monthly survey saying they saw FOMO, it peaked at about 92% in very late 2020. That now sits at 3%. Right at the end of uh, June, my survey I've got underway at the moment, it's showing only 3% of agents think people have FOMO. Foop, Back in October, 19% of agents said people seem to be a bit worried that they'll buy and prices will fall. Now it's 77%. So it's those price expectations and price fears moving around that could really set a market up and down. And of course, cryptos, the big extreme of all of that, big extreme price movements. Bearing in mind what we were talking about before with it being a in relative terms, a short, sharp tornado as opposed to a, you know, a long-term issue, and we're just feeling the kind of brunt of it at the moment. Um, that flows really into monetary policy, inflation, and interest rates, doesn't it, Tony? And your predictions. So we talk about this every month, but where are you leaning now, a month further into the trajectory on monetary policy, kind of interest interest rates and inflation? Yeah, well, we've just seen a round of fixed interest rate increases from the uh, banks just being completed at the moment. It means for the uh, one to five year fixed mortgage rates, they're now between three and three and a half percent higher than they were at, at the low points, let's say the first half of 2021. I think there's only a little bit further up that you will see the interest rates go for the two to five year terms. And the reason for that is that although the Reserve Bank's cash rate is, is only 2%, they project four, I think they'll get to maybe, maybe three and a half. The markets have, have already factored in at least a move to 4%, in fact, slightly higher. And the fixed interest rates reflect expectations of what will happen in the future, not what is happening right now. And what's interesting is because we've had our central bank and other central banks saying, we're going to raise interest rates quickly. And as I, I hopefully noted last month, our central bank has said, we are going to explicitly take the risk of raising interest rates too far, too fast, crushing growth too much because we have to get inflation down. It means everything's shortened in time. So whereas the, our central bank previously thought the peak for interest rates will be the middle of 2024, now they're saying the middle of 2023, I actually think it's going to come earlier than that. All people have to do is sort of get through this, uh, this what is still going to be a fairly tight next six to 12 month period of high cost of living increase and the debt servicing costs going up uh, as well. The disaster will be the people who just quite can't make it through the last six months you know, servicing their mortgage and hopefully not too many of them given the good job market that still sits out there. To summarise, it's it's a bit more short term pain for long term gain is, is what I'm hearing across the board. And like Tony and I always say, if you are struggling or you're unsure or just you know, feeling not very pleasant about what's happening at the supermarket or the petrol pump, you know, get the right advice because the third of people that do have mortgages in this country, there are smarter ways of doing it. You've just got to think about what you can control. Okay, so let's dig a bit more into housing construction and supply, which, um, you know, most New Zealanders are 
very interested in. Uh, we are in a declining house market. Um, how low can they go, Tony? So far, on average, New Zealand prices are down by 7.7%. Auckland's down about 12. Wellington's down about 11. I think maybe we're about halfway on average, but maybe Auckland and Wellington just a little bit ahead of the pack, sort of timing-wise. Mm. I'd spoken uh, so many times over the past 12 to 15 months about a Wellington. It's gone beyond the pale. When I I live in Porirua City. And when I see uh, stories in the newspapers about house prices soaring in what tend to be some relatively low income locations in, uh, in Porirua, Waitangarua, Cannons Creek, etc., I've noted from previous cycles that's usually a sign we're getting towards the end of the cycle. And that's why for so much of last year I was saying we're in the end game for this house price uh, boom. So prices are down. There's maybe, who knows, maybe another 7% or so to, to go there. The next big change, however, it's not actually prices, it's construction. The number of consents issued for new houses to be built, it peaked out at about 51,000. We're almost sort of there at the moment. That's now going to drop away, I'd say, particularly sharply over the next uh, 6, 12, 18 months because a lot of people simply don't want to risk uh, signing up for a new build when they hear there's no jib, the, you can't get the black taps uh, that you want. The staff aren't there. They're going to work across in mm -hmm. Australia where you know it's still booming, etc. So the house construction thing is put, turning very quickly uh, at the moment. And the feedback I'm getting from the sector is they're still going to be going gangbusters for six months and a bit beyond, but sort of getting out towards maybe nine, 12 months, there are holes starting to appear in the production schedules for those uh, building companies. So there is unfortunately going to be some weeding out happening in the property construction sector. And that's because of my family's exper experience with these unfortunate circumstances in the 1970s. That's why I've jumped up and down str so strongly warning about uh, 17, 16 months ago about what was about to come along for house construction. Went up too far it's now got quite a correction coming along. You've been pointing out in some of your updates that there's a, uh, an interesting um, insight with investors. Do you want to share that with, with everybody? Yes, one of the things I've noted is that when March 23 last year came along, the finance minister announced uh, tax regime changes for the investors. Everybody spat the dummies, said they're going to put their rents through the roof, they were going to sell off their properties. Uh, I had 3,500 people reply to a special survey saying exactly that. And I said, yeah, no, I don't think so, given the low level of interest rates you'd get on a bank deposit, etc. And ever since then, what I've said repeatedly is there is no evidence. There is exactly zero evidence of a wave of investor selling. And in fact, what I can see from especially my monthly uh, survey of real estate agents is there is a decrease in the number of investors looking at selling. They can see that the market mm. is weak. Most of them have held their property for a good number of years. They've been planning to hold it for a good number of years and they can choose which cycle they sell it in. Most of them are, do simply do not have to sell. So um, th there is no wave of investors uh, placing uh, properties on the market because they are distressed sellers. As equally, there won't be all that many mortgagee sales for somebody who's bought a place you know, last year or the year before because the job security is relatively good. The biggest woe in the market is more going to be in the new build space. Too many property developers, uh, too leveraged and inexperienced and over optimistic. That is where, if you're looking for a bargain, if you're an investor looking at this and you're thinking, where are the bargains going to appear? It's not going to be in the existing properties. It's going to be in the partially completed new development area. Um, good luck. You need a bit uh, bigger than average amount of capital in order to get involved there. Now, I want to talk briefly about the triple CFA, and it, it was such a factor for businesses like ours and clients. Um, and it seems, given these other headlining issues, it, it does seem to have kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit. But um, you know, lending and credit conditions are contracting. Um, will the upcoming triple CFA changes, so that's the, the cre Consumer Credits Contracts and Finance Act, uh, um, the changes that were made that put us into basically a credit crunch, Tony, in your terms. Um, do you think that's going to have any impact, the changes they're making? They seem to be quite um, minimal at this stage, but like lessening, making it a little bit more practical, let's put it that way, for people to access money and for the banks and advisors like us to do our job properly. So um, what's your take? 
year things even after the tweaks which have been announced and become effective from July 7 we're not going back to the environment as it was before December 1 last year when the uh, triple CFA changes you know, came into effect the banks are still uncertain about exactly what irresponsible consumer lending is it's not specifically defined in the legislation there so you know that uncertainty remains there is going to be a slight improvement because it's now made explicitly clear that they shouldn't count regular savings as an expense. Um, it's got some, you know, some, some allowance made now for if you've got a mortgage, you're not going to keep flipping over to Fiji once every six weeks as you were doing previously. So they can sort of make that assumption of a but change in spending habits change. going forward. Yeah, so there's some... That your behaviour yeah. will change. Yeah. Yep, yep. So it's a slight improvement, but it's not back to where it was before. And as we've just seen um, recently with one bank saying they are now no longer doing any new approvals for a while for uh, loans where there's less than a 20% deposit, they are worried about breaking that uh, November 1 uh, uh, change for the loan to value ratios. From November 1 last year, banks could only have 10% maximum of new lending involved low deposits. Um, before that it was 20% and clearly that is still an issue for some lenders out there so we're not in the depths of the credit crunch which was sort of October, November, December, January, maybe into February, that was the worst of it. Things have got easy, but we're nowhere near where we were previously. Credit is still hard to get. And so for a lot of buyers out there, they're going to find they still can't get a mortgage for some time. What I'm picking is there's a chance Let's give it a 40% probability. Before the end of the year, the Reserve Bank will tweak the LVRs, ease up a bit there. Um, it's not a high probability, but I think they'll be looking at the speed with which house prices are going down, the weakness in consumer spending, and I can't help but think they'll just look to tweak that a little bit uh, down the track. I, I agree. I think so too. But, you know, what do I know? Um, look, Tony, is there anything else you'd like to add because it does like i said at the beginning it does feel i use the word heavy it's a little bit heavy for people that um at the moment and for kiwis um everyone's talking about it you know whether it's i can't get staff um you know my lettuce was six dollars my favorite um you know oh my god i can't believe how much i just paid to put petrol in my car um you know what's your you do always give us a nice kind of measured kind of take what's your outtake for people to kind of go away with we're all being affected by things we can't change mm. at the moment none of us can change the 6.9 percent inflation rate the interest rates what's happening in europe what's happening in china etc and when there's a lot of stuff around you that you can't change you start to feel a bit helpless and and you're naturally worried but you you sort of subconsciously never consciously but subconsciously you realize there is actually something i can control and that is my fear I'm going to have a high degree of fear and I'm going to run around a bit like a headless chook but at least you feel like you're doing something and you're spreading woe to other people. You say, oh mate, I'll tell you, this is really going bad out there. It feels quite powerful to say that to your, to your friends, your family, the blokes down at the pub, etc. So psychologically, what we tend to embrace in these trying times is negative thought because we can inject some power and some feeling of control to that negative thought when otherwise so much is, is not controllable. What I invite people to do is realise that there is power in talking negatively to other people. Try and step back from it and just remember, see, that this is the bread and butter for us economists. Things move in cycles. When times are booming, people think it won't end. They buy too much. They borrow too much. They hate the bankers because the bankers have seen this and don't lend them all that they want to borrow. But then things go easy on the other side and people get too worried. They sell too much. Uh, they put off life plans too, too, too long. They say, the banks lent me too much. Even though I wanted a million more, they still lent me too much. We look to blame somebody outside. So just remember, things move in cycles. And this cycle might, might have looked like, let's say, like that. This one's going, Ugh! and it's going to be a quick falling off and then a bit of a plateau, I'd suggest, from the middle of 2023. Cut your spending, plan your overseas holiday maybe for the second half of 2023, delay what you were going to do just to free up some finances for the weekly shopping for the uh, coming 12 months. And do you know, it's really interesting, I was speaking to one of our consultants, our leading consultant, the other day about this, and, and she had a similar view in terms of 
focus on what you can control and there actually are things you can control and she was quite blunt she said wake up shake up and take back control and I really liked it because it's you know you, you're right you can't control these macro factors but you can control what you do and unless you're in um, you know major strife there, there are always things you can do and that's part of the service we offer but it's it's literally going oh okay I need to have a look at how I'm managing this and it's an opportunity to roll that through into the good times as well and actually achieve that financial freedom which is something we talk about in NZHL a lot so for us as a business um, we find in these times we get a lot of people coming to talk to us because it's and it's an opportunity to roll that through into the good times and change their habits and behaviours. So I will leave it on that note. And just to close out, as we say every month, um, Tony is an independent economist. We like it that way. His views are his own and not necessarily those of NZHL and vice versa. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, please feel free to uh, pop some questions underneath and um, I can ask Tony that next month round. Thanks a lot.